It is in progress. All right. Good morning. And today we are going to do the final step of taking uh, a subject from a photo through composing it and altering it down into the NOTAN. That's all the stuff that we've done. And today we're going to add color and we're going to basically translate the NOTAN into a finished painting of some sort, right? <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to be using this smaller piece. This is an eight by eight. This is what I did all those little, um, all the hundred paintings in a hundred days were on these eight by eight paintings, sheets. So definitely in the class that I'll be teaching, you know, I'm, um, my suggestion is that you paint small if you're trying to paint day by day, um, just to make something achievable. This is a good size. Um, I think even smaller would be fine if you're finding yourself unable to paint. I'd rather have people paint instead of, you know, feeling overwhelmed. So just to say, right, like bigger paintings are wonderful. They are wonderful, but they're also bigger and they take more time and sometimes we don't have time. So um, I wanted to show you guys the, um, the Notan, right? We'll be doing, um, the the photo that I have in the the second blog post, which was composition and action, that's the one that we'll be using. And this little sketch here is the notan that I made from it. So for those who haven't done notans with me before, and for those who haven't done them in quite a long time, and they have done them with me before, right? The the goal for the notan is that we're looking at the contrast in each area of the painting, the subject, and we're finding the contrast in that space. So in, in the original photo, there are definitely areas like this area way in the distance, there's a, a little far away secondary hill. And this little far away secondary hill is um, lighter. It's kind of being recessed in the misty morning light. But in the way a notan functions, or at least the way that I teach it, it's not about sort of absolute value in rendering it to the notan. If it was about absolute value, all of this in the, in the distance would, wouldn't be here because it's all paler than these nice dark shapes that are in the foreground. But of course, these, these little shapes in the distance are important for this painting because that's where our eye is being led. So in this little area, we have um, these trees and they are darker than what is behind it. So in that area, they're gonna appear, right? And that's the way we're gonna be thinking about the notan and how we're gonna apply it. We'll be doing a lot of these in the class just to say, um, and I, I'm always recommending it to students if you're having problems, I think it's a wonderful way to simplify a painting. People ask a lot, do I do them every time I paint? No. It's a short answer, but I've been doing it for a lot longer. What I do, I will say though, is that if I have a subject that I am having a hard time with, I do make a note in. And it's a wonderful way to sort of educate myself about um, how I can see the subject differently. Sometimes it makes problems compositionally really clear um, and it helps you solve problems. And then I'll dive back into doing the painting. So definitely, um, I still use notans. I like making them. They're fun. Um, but also, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to sort of educate myself on the subject. These, these little subjects here are about a five by seven painting, right? I'm like, here's my hand. Um, and maybe it's four by six, something like that. And this is probably, I do some bigger for fun, but the truth is this is a good size. And some of them are, are really big. This is really almost a little piece of art in and of itself that I'm having fun with. But this was also for a painting I was doing that was uh, two, 30 inches tall and 40 inches wide. So I did the Notan bigger to explore more shapes because I was making this really big painting by my standards. But for example, here's like little Notans, right? And these are, I don't know, maybe three by four something like that. And I'm still exploring the big shapes and exploring edges and how they connect. So these work really well. Um, 
as we jump into working on the, the painting, you know, I'll be talking more about the Notan and how it's gonna guide me into the process of um, layering things. Because what ends up happening is that everything that's white in the Notan is the palest value in that portion of the painting, right? So it's not that it's the palest value everywhere. It's just that in that area of the painting, it's mm. the palest value. And so oftentimes, generally speaking, if it's white in this initial phase where we have the no tan, it's gonna be part of the initial wash, right? So that's gonna help guide me in terms of how I'm applying paint. That's my dog. So we're gonna have <laughs> we're gonna have the, the initial wash will be paler and then um it'll dry and then on top of it we'll go a whole assortment of values pale values will go away in this distance and then we're going to have darker values in the foreground but they're all going to be part of the second wash right because they're going to go on top of the palest values underneath it yes you can come through darling don't worry um so um right i just want to kind of touch on the no tan and talk about it at the beginning of this because I'm gonna come back to it and it's gonna be sort of guiding me and guiding you through the process of painting. So I'm going to take this, this camera here and make it dominant. So let's remove that pin. There we go. So, um, now everybody should be able to see this kind of up close, right? That's what I'm aiming for. So just like always, it's not always, always, but it's a lot of the time, I am gonna wet the back. So I have here a big fat brush. Wet in the back. And, um, if I'm in the studio, I almost always do this. I just, it really helps slow down the drying process. And I like that. And it also helps my paper not uh, warp when I put washes on it. Here I'm wetting down my board and then I'm slapping that puppy on. So um, I slap it on, I hold it down so that it creates a little bit of water tension between itself and the board. And then I grab my handy dandy kitchen spritzer. I love these like uh, endless spritzers. They're really soft. The spray is really gentle. I'm spraying the top of this just a little because I want to equalize a little bit of um, the moisture inside the body of the paper, right? It's soaking up all this water that I put in underneath it. And so the bottom is expanding and that's why it was curling on these. And if I can get just a little bit of moisture on the top of the paper, um, it will help it lay down flat and then it'll start to really soak up the water at the corners. So I do like to use a tissue. And um, I'm relatively liberal with their use. Um, while this is soaking up paper, I'll just say that you know you can see on the other little camera, um, I always carry a little rag, a little cotton rag, and I'll daub off my brush on the rag a lot. I have um, I'm using Saunders Waterford uh, rough for the paper, and I'm not super finicky about what people use or, um, you know, recommendations. I think it should be 100% uh, cotton and an artist grade paper. I think the paper can often make the biggest difference in the technical aspect of your paints and equipment because the paint responds very, very differently to different kinds of paper. Um, and I'll be using, after this initial phase, I'll, I'll use a little mop for the initial wash. And then I'll be using 
a couple of synthetics and a Chinese calligraphy brush. These are Escoda Perlas and I have a size six, that's the little one, and a size 12. And um, I have a little Chinese calligraphy brush that I like to use. These are from Inkston, I-N-K-S-T-O-N, -N, like Inkstone, uh, but without the E, they're Inkston. And I love these brushes because they let me, um, I can paint like a flat, right? But I can also roll the brush and I can get, a soft little point actually with it, which is great. Um, and then if I want to splay the bristles like a mop, I can get really interesting effects with this. So I do use this brush a lot. Um, so that's probably everything that I'll be using. Um, I'm just testing how cool the surface is, right? And we've reached that point where if I pick this up, I you know, turn it sideways, the paper doesn't want to fall off. It's all just water tension that is um, making it stay for the duration of the painting. This will be this way for the next hour and change. Um, so for some of these subjects, you know, I don't normally, I don't always sketch it, but uh, I wanted to at least touch on it for the demo so that you can get some sort of sense of what's going on in my mind. The, so in, in the subject that I showed you, it, it's a vertical and I have a little square here. And one of the things this does when I get a square that I like about using a square is it forces me to really think about what the main subject is, right? Because Sometimes we have these vertical sheets or really wide horizontal sheets and we get in love with the format and it has a bunch of information that's actually not really very pertinent. Um, you know, it's part of the story, broadly speaking, but when you have a square, for me, it really makes me drill down and think, okay, what can I cut from this subject? What is essential and what can I cut? And of course, I cannot cut this path. So when I look at the photo, what I see is, that the one side of the, of the path starts about in the middle. So I do often go through this process mentally. I uh, take off my quarters and I'm big, making it into quadrants. And this is gonna help me locate um, a lot of the subject matter, right? So I see here's the path and it comes across and it almost goes to the other side. And then I see here's this other side and it actually, comes off the, uh, the paper at the bottom. It doesn't go off the paper at the side. And then over here, this other path, side of the path starts uh, about in the middle and it goes off to the side over here. Um, we have here this little additional path and it doesn't come even close to halfway up. Of course, I'm making this a square, but you can see it. And I'm doing this lightly. I don't wanna, as I say, I don't wanna paint this painting with my pencil. I wanna paint it with my brush. So this is really just meant to help me see certain shapes. I'm just outlining certain basic shapes. When we look at the blog post I did, one of the things um, you, that I shared is the first phase of the post uh, I like marked out the edges of the big shapes, right? And then I started to fill them in with my Pentel brush to get the, the note tan. And that's basically what I'm doing here. I'm just marking out the edges of some of the big shapes. This comes up. Here's, I'm gonna, I like the sun in the subject. So I'm gonna, uh, this come up here. And then of course, I don't want a bunch of pencil marks over the sun. So I'm just leaving it empty there, but I know it's the goal is to include it. And I'm sort of gesturing the edges. I'll, I'll bring this up to the camera in. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was funny. I'll bring it up. <laughs> I'll bring it up to the camera after I uh, finish sketching it. The other big focal points are these, uh, these bold shapes, which is the um, eucalyptus trees. So I'm just blocking in this edge. And this edge is important that I'm sketching in here because that's an edge that I actually wanna keep 
right? It's an edge in the no tan where I have a light edge meeting a dark edge. And so I'm gonna preserve some of the light values of the initial wash uh, when I make my dark values on top. And I'm, that's gonna help me create the edge of this tree. This comes down. And then I see here's the next one. And, I can, and I'm looking at the photo and I'm doing comparisons about location. So the trunk of this second tree is actually lower than the final horizon line way up here, right? This actually goes off screen. So I can see that this little sketch mark I made here is not correct, but I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time erasing it. It won't matter once I'm done painting it. So actually part of this trunk is, is, is not on the paper. So I move the trunk over to open up the space in between the two trunks. Remember when I was doing the blog post about this, I was talking a lot about how I wanted to open up this space over here so we had some activity on this side so it wouldn't be a big black blob. And I wanted to allow this activity here where we have dark and light shapes intermingling. I wanna help use that to balance the intermingling of light and dark shapes over here, right? Uh, I think everybody would like to compare themselves to Monet, but obviously in that subject that I was sharing on the blog post, right? He has the little river scene and right. The idea is I'm sure he was putting in those sky holes in the trees and he was moving in those little elements that were uh, sort of a pale lavender into the river. And we don't really know, unfortunately, what he saw, but um, you know, it's not like he somehow magically went out there and saw a perfectly composed purple and you know lavender image. I'm sure he was working at creating something that he felt was compelling. So you know our goal is to do the same. So here I'm just I'm creating this broken edge on the canopy edge, and I'm not spending a lot of time to make it perfect. I'm just sort of notating it because I course I want this open area in the middle to remain open. The other thing that I am paying attention to is there's a little element of lit foliage that's up against this trunk. And I wanna preserve that lit foliage, right? It's part of, in the no tan, it's, it's a white area. And I'm gonna leave all this space in between the two trunks empty. I'm not gonna sketch it. Why? Because my experience is that this is an area where we get to play. And we know we have this reference photo we know that we want to have an intermingling of light and dark shapes. But like I said, I, I want to paint it with my brush. I don't want to paint it with the pencil. And I think we'll have a far more lively um, intermixing of marks if we try not to fill in like color inside the lines experience here. So I'm also not going to sketch the cast shadows that are coming across the street, this, this path for sure. I want those to be fresh and I want them to, you know, just to let the brushes play and create it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this up, get this a little closer so we can see what we're looking at, right? There we go. Just to give you a sense of what this initial sketch looked like. What are the shapes that I think, oh, the edge of that shape is kind of important. And what are the shapes that I think Meh, you know, that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna design it with our brush as we go. So there we go. Now we're back on here. So this is still nice and cool. And um, if you're painting along, um, I'm gonna do the initial wash. And one of the fun things I'm gonna do in this painting, and that's gonna help us speed things along, is it was a very bright, sunny day. And it was a bright, like a misty day, right? So actually a portion of the sky, I'm not gonna paint. I'm just gonna leave it dry and white. And I'm gonna drop a little bit of color up into the sky up here. And then I'm gonna grade it out with a wet brush. And it's gonna, that'll be adequate for the story we're gonna tell about this vibrant light coming in. Now, who knows what the sky was really like 
you know, we're telling a story. And of course, I'm sure there are days when the blue comes down. But for this, I'm going to roll with it like this. And you're, you're going to see what we're going to do. So I'm going to grab a little bit of cobalt blue. And I'm using my mop. It's very pale, right? Maybe a little more. There we go. I want a little bit of sky up top. And this might be enough. And I don't want it to go here because I'm going to have that little sunshine there, right? So I'm actually going to grab a little bit of uh, burnt sienna. I'm going to make a little tiny bit of cad, cad yellow. And I'm going to drop a little bit of warmth into this area or behind where the sun's going to be. There we go. Um, so that little spot by my standards is complete. I'm, I might like, while it's very wet, I can come in and I can grab, you know, a little more blue, right? If I want to make, give it a little punch. And it goes behind these little sky holes in the tree. And then I'm going to take my clean water, which is underneath here, right? So if you haven't been with me before, just to say, I always have two, um, two little bowls of water. And I have sacrilegiously, I can see now, switched the color. So the blue is usually like this, and it is the magic blue clean water. So. And it's just a lot about, my goal is to create um, habits, right? The clean water is always in the same spot. The dirty water is always in the same spot. They're always the same colors uh, bowl. And then I don't have to think about it when I'm painting. So that's, um, that's just, it helps because I got a lot of, I got enough stuff to think about. I'm taking the clean water and I'm just getting it to go underneath here. Why? Because of course I don't want some sort of chunky little edge on the sky. So one of the things that we have going on in here is we have bits of blue. So I'm gonna to switch to a smaller brush, right? We're doing a pretty small painting. So um, I said blue, but it's green. You have bits of green in here and they're highlights, right? And remember when we were, when we were, when I was showing the no tan, and I said, hey, there are areas in here where it's white. Right. Bring it in here. This is one of the things that makes this no tan interesting and complicated. There are areas that are white, and it's actually a sky that we're seeing in the no tan. There are areas that are white, and it's actually the trunk of the tree that we're seeing that's been lit. And there are areas that are white that are actually the, the light valued green leaves of the foliage, right? And they're also white in the no-tan because the value shift is so dramatic between the leaves that are lit here by sunlight and the dark leaves that are around them, right? So the no-tan is all about, like I said, local contrast. So, right, in this area here, it's the foliage, but over here, it actually is as their sky holes and we're seeing through it to what's behind it. So. The no tan helps me visualize what goes into the first wash and what goes second. It helps me just separate everything. I know, hey, I need to get these pale values in here early so I can, I can use them later when I do the dark values on top. <clears throat> so I'm gonna mix up a green that's gonna go in here. And it's pretty vibrant, but it's also a eucalyptus tree. So it's not gonna be like, Incredibly zingy. I'm using cad yellow, cad yellow light, and I'm using cobalt turquoise green and cobalt blue. And I like to separate my color mixes into different areas, right? I have a, my warm colors, my cool colors, my greens, and then oftentimes I have an area where I work with opaque color. So when I apply this, I'm definitely making sure I'm keeping the edge of the trunk. 
right? Because the trunk is not going to be green. So I want to keep that little bit of light on the, the trunk, just like I was saying a moment ago. The, tr the trunk is vibrant. I clean off my brush and get it to be not having any um, paint on it. And I soften my edge. And I'm gonna drop in, just looking at where I kept my, my, my whites in the note hand. It's something like this. There's actually a little bit of light on the other side of the um, trunk. Okay. And you know, it's funny, these little areas actually have a bit of green in them now, but my experience over the years is that the eye really wants contrast and it'll make it even if it's not there. So this area right now is like a very, very pale green, but later I'll, you know, I'll do these dark shadows on top for the foliage and this will become white. And, I'll, and I've learned that sometimes I'll spend all this time, you know, preserving Maybe this should be blue because it's the sky behind it or something. And we could try it out, see how it goes. But experientially, it doesn't matter. Experientially, the eye turns it into white once you put the darker values on top. Down in here is more of the area that's white in the notan. It's actually an area where we have sunlit foliage again. So I'm grabbing more cad yellow. I'd like it to be a little warmer. And there we go. I'm actually gonna take a little more cad yellow. And I'm gonna go back in here, make this area a tiny bit more vibrant. This comes down, there we go. Okay, so, in here, it's full of uh, all the leaves and foliage that falls down from the eucalyptus trees. And that's a warm, it's a muted warm hue. So I take a bunch of burnt sienna, I take a little bit of ultramarine blue, right? And I'm just making kind of a, a muted brown. And in the note tan, You know, it's a lot of white in here and that's going to be the color that I'm dropping in now. And then we're going to put, you know, little shadows in later to create the illusion of um, all the little cut edges of the bark and stuff that's fallen on the ground. So this goes in and it's relatively um, pale, but you know, it's got color. <coughs> And it has little speckles of white in it. I'm actually looking a little bit at the photo, right? So there's, it's not all 100% um, got color in it. You know, the eye sees these little pieces of uh, white. And little refracting bits of highlights. So I'm just kind of dancing around with the brush and I'm deliberately not filling in everywhere. And I'm trying to change the direction that my brush goes so that it doesn't all look like they're all going in the same direction, right? And don't on a certain level, you don't have to worry too much about this part because we could just go over it later if we don't like it and you know cover up some of these holes. So I think you're gonna have more problems, you know, filling it all in now than you will if you do the opposite. You can always go back over it later, make it more muted, make it less vibrant, fill in little areas that are white or whatever the case might be. So in here, 
we have um, a cool gray. So I take the ultramarine blue and a little bit of this burnt sienna. And this area is very pale and sunny. So I'm actually gonna add a little more water and yep, pretty pale, a little sparkly even. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and then I want to get some of these little areas where we have highlights of green. And just going around the painting, trying to, um, right, essentially paint what is white in my no tan. Right, these are all the things I'm gonna preserve and paint on top of later, and these will be little highlights. And then we have this little area in the distance. I'm gonna to switch to a smaller brush because it's a smaller shape. And it is um, recessive, right? It's in the distance, so it's bluer. And it's got a little bit of green in it though. So I'm mixing up my muted blue gray with the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna. And I'm taking that over to this little area in my greens and I'm just grabbing some of it and mixing it in to get myself a muted, um, yeah, nice muted green. So these little areas in the distance, they are a dark value. I mean, they're a pale value, but in locally, everything's gonna be white behind it. So they are as dark as it's gonna get. So I'm just dropping in this shape. And I can see this is a little bit of a browner here. It's the ground plane again. Eh, too much. And then I have to find a way to separate this area here in the foreground from this area back in here. So I have again a very pale wash, even paler. And I'm going to keep a little seam. And don't forget, I can always go darker later. So it's not imperative that I complete this area to 100% satisfaction right now. Just want to get the initial value comparison in, right? Which is that in the no tan, this is a black area because it's dark, it's, it is the dark value in that area. It just happens to be a little tricksy because it's comparatively a, a very pale value in the rest of the painting. There we go. And this is good. So, This phase, this is pretty close to done. I'm gonna drop in a little color onto these tree trunks because the areas that are sunlit, that are actually, they're the white areas in my no tan, they actually have a little bit of color, right? They're not just white. So I'm just gonna get a little bit of color in there and it's gonna let us build on top of it later. And I can see they have a little bit of blue in the shadows because they're um, 
actually very up, up. They're pale, so they're capturing the reflected light of the sky. Here we go. I'm gonna do the same over here. Okay. Grab a little brown. And I'm gonna be painting all kinds of stuff into this later. I'm just prepping the space so I have a little colored highlights that I can use. So th at, this is the, at the beginning, this is everything for phase one, so to speak. Everything that we're gonna do on top of this, these will be the little highlights that we're gonna preserve. Let me get this. Well, you guys can actually see it pretty good from here. So um, in a moment, I'm gonna blow this dry, but I didn't know if anybody had a question that they wanted to ask me at like, you know, at this intermission, so to speak, in the painting process. All right, since it's quiet, I'm gonna take that to mean you're good. And I'm gonna go blow dry this. Sonia, you raised your hand. Let me see if I can open up the chat or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, um, why don't you sketch the um, scene before you wet the paper? I find, and it's mm. probably because I've got too heavy a hand, that I sometimes engrave <laughs> into the yeah. paper if the paper's wet. So if I was doing this, and the short answer is it's not a bad idea to sketch before you but the back. Um, and um, I, when I'm doing a demo, I'm just looking to speed the process up, honestly. So I wet the back, it starts to soak it in. And then while it's soaking it in, I'm sketching it, right? Otherwise I have to wet the back. I, I would sketch first, wet the back, and then we would hang out and drink coffee for five minutes. And then I would start to paint. Um, so truthfully, I would say um, sketching first isn't bad if you're going to do a sketch, right? So it's a good question. And also, um, Claire was asking, am I painting flat or at an angle? And I'm currently flat, right? Um, sometimes uh, if I want to, you know, do a wash for like a big sky and I want it to be even, I'll tilt the board for sure. I'll tilt the board then because it helps the water run just very gently and it helps smooth out my washes. But for this right now, particularly because I'm doing a demo and I wanna film it from above, I'm painting flat. But the honest truth is I often paint flat in the studio. It helps, um, it helps it dry slower. And um, if I'm painting wet into wet, stuff tends to explode less, right? Um, when I'm painting plein air, I'll often tape it because the wind is going to come and blow it away. And I'll often paint it in an angle on purpose because um, I need it to dry faster and it won't dry, right? Like up in Mendocino, sometimes I was painting at an angle on purpose because I just couldn't get it to dry. And once I'm done with this phase, I was stuck. I was like, well, what am I going to do now? So um, it depends on the situation, just what it is that I'm doing. So let's, I'm gonna close the chat box for the moment. And I'm gonna, um, I am going to go blow dry my paper real quick. I'll be back in probably a minute. Yes, it is a bathroom break, or as they say, a bio break. So um, if you need to use the bathroom, this is a good opportunity to do so. Well, I can never quite figure out how to mute that. That's, that's fine. We're just going to blow it and deal with it.
<laughs> All right. That's probably probably less than a minute. Um, and that's fine. Uh, we're not in a, it's not a sprint to the end. Um, I, so <laughs> I'm dawdling for a moment in case somebody needed to use the bathroom while I was blowing everything dry. Um, this is now dry to the touch. And what's great is that if I tilt this, it still sticks to the board, right? So it's an amazing thing to me, but the surface is dry and, um, but the body of the paper is still holding that moisture inside of it. So what I'm gonna do next is I am gonna start uh, from the top left. I'm gonna work my way across the paper. Go ahead, pardon me, we're, we're feeding the pets. Go ahead and start do that now, darling. Okay. So I'm gonna, um, the darker value in this is the, the, the tree that's in shadow here. The, and so I'm gonna start just, I'm grabbing a bunch of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, and I am getting a really dark value. And I'm gonna take this over here. And now I have a really dark value and I'm gonna mix a green up and I'm gonna use that dark value to kind of start things off. Okay, and I think, okay, I need more blue. I need, this is Perlin green. It's just a very, very dark green and it's helpful for getting these in here. This is one of the darkest parts of the entire painting. So I'm just getting this thick, I'm getting it dark. It's almost black. And all the other sections are gonna become lighter than this as they recede in. So I'm starting with the darkest value. <laughs> and here we go. So I'm actually gonna, um, not paint the tree trunk for a moment. I'm just gonna block in this really dark green. And you might notice I'm not uh, filling it in. I'm, I'm allowing myself to look through it. Goodbye, love. And um, my better half is heading out. So I'm not filling it in like a coloring book or something. I'm allowing myself little little holes in the sky and those in the trees. And that's letting me see through it and have that kind of depth that a tree has where we can see other parts of the canopy elements. We go see through it to the sky, you know, whatever the case might be. And there we go. And we're on our way bit by bit. Um, I'm looking at my photo a little bit. And I'm also just looking at the painting as I, as I make my way through it and right, responding to the subject. So definitely, of course, this super dark green value does come up to the edge of the tree. Now, later we're gonna put a dark value in the tree and it's gonna kind of soften the relationship between, you know, obviously this very pale shape right now, the trunk and, and the really dark foliage. But for the moment, we're just gonna continue with this green. And then <clears throat> we're gonna do this little shape in here. And then I'm gonna connect the edges to the shape and it'll actually be, we'll be painting wet into wet once we come in here, right? because this will still be moist where I'm painting the foliage. So remember when I said I didn't wanna paint it with my pencil, I wanted to paint it with my brush. And this is that part where I get to do that. So I'm using the edge of the, of the Chinese brush, right? But just to say, I could use like this little Escoda Perla would do the job just great. It's got a nice sharp point. And um, I can just 
make little marks, right? So if you don't have a fancy calligraphy brush, it's fine. Um, alternately, if you do have something like a, um, here I'm just making fun little marks. I also have, for example, this reservoir liner, right? I have another one that's a little Alvaro Castanet one. This one I got from Rosemary and Company. And for example, if I want to make some of these little squiggly marks, right? This is a great tool for doing that. It just makes expressive, tiny little marks that sometimes are difficult to do if you're um, doing it with a normal brush. So there's lots of ways to approach it. And it doesn't have to be this brush, but you need a brush that can make a nice point, right? And then you gotta be able to fill it in and you have to leave little bits and pieces that, so you can see through it, which is one of the key elements of the way that a tree canopy functions visually. Um, so in the Notan, right, if we pull this back, this area here is open and it's creating, we have two primary pockets, one open area down here and one open area up here, and they're helping us balance out the shapes. So definitely I'm doing something similar. We have a primary open spot here, right? And we're gonna have another one down here. And I'm gonna help create this one at the bottom by capturing it with an additional uh, dark patch at the bottom on the horizon line. And it goes across. You can see that. There we go. Something like that. So it's good to paint in one little area and kind of get it under control and then move into another spot, right? That way, area by area, we're completing the wet into wet work that we want to do before we move into another area. And then, you know, sadness occurs because, <laughs> sadness occurs because um, we're not able to control our mixes because it's drying over here and we're working on the other side or something like that, right? That's bad news. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm working over here and now I'm starting to build this tree trunk. So the tree trunk is in shade, that's why it's blue, but it's closer to us and so we can see a, a wider range of values in it than we can in some of the other parts of the painting, you know, things that are in shadow. So I have here my ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mix, so trusty. And over here I'm going to add extra uh, burnt sienna, right? Why? Because in the shadows, we still have this kind of variety of hues. It's moving from a blue uh, into a brown and back and forth. And of course, it's streaky, right? It's, it's, it's a eucalyptus tree. I'd like it to be a little warmer than that. There we go. And it goes up and down. And Remember how in the I was saying in the in the notan sometimes we are those little white sections are the sky and sometimes they're going to be this bright foliage and sometimes the white sections are the edges of the tree trunks and so that's what I'm painting now for this little section right and I'm painting the edge of the tree trunk in a funny sort of way and painting it by not painting it, right? I'm painting it negatively. So, and it starts to appear as sunlit because of the dark sections that we have in the foliage, right? So we're squeezing the light and we're grabbing it between the foliage and the trunk. And then out of that, we get this tasty little edge that is sunlit up the uh, length of the tree. There we go. Ooh, this brush is 
super blue. So I have a like a super dirty hand and a super dirty brush. So I'm gonna go and wash this off so I don't accidentally get it all over the painting. I'll be back in just a second. Okay, so I, I cleaned off my hand. I've done that before. That's a sad day when you're like, oh, I just ruined my painting with this super blue blob in the middle of my sky or some such thing. I've definitely done that. So here is this tree in shadow and as it dries, right, we, we can add little bits of detail that we want to, to it to have maybe more bark edges and things. The other thing to say is we have this little area in here where we have all these dark shapes that are interconnected and it's a relatively thick application of paint and it's relatively dry. So I can, I can come in here with my fingernails and I can scrape out little shapes if I want. Right, or if you have like a, a, a palette knife, you can do it with a palette knife. And then I can actually go back over these and make them complicated by daubing in sections over them. And one of the things this does, I find in a painting that's so nice is now not everything is a negative shape. I'm actually making an active mark with my finger, um, but, it's a, but it's a pale active mark. And the eye can see these interesting combinations of, um, Yes, I shall review the colors. Thank you for reminding me. So sometimes we make an active mark with the brush and it's a little interesting mark. And then sometimes we can come in and make an active mark with our fingernail or some other object like that into the dark paint. And we can get alternate shapes basically. And the eye, I, my experience is the eye finds these really interesting. So now this comes, boop. Um, so, we're gonna do the next tree trunk and we're gonna do the next batch of light on the side of the trunk, right? And then this whole area will be done. Now I'm right-handed, so I don't wanna um, start on the left and then smear across my paper, right? I guess if you were left-handed, you might wanna try painting the other direction. Um, Claire was asking, what are my paints? That's a great question. Some folks have been done this before with me, but it's good for me to remember that I'm here to serve everybody. So um, I use a lot of cadmiums and I use a lot of semi-opaque pigments. That's definitely part of my process. So I have a cadmium lemon and cad yellow. I have two wells of cad yellow. One of them I use for mixing greens and one of them I use for mixing warm hues because the, the yellow is so delicate, of course, that once it gets dirty, it's really hard to use it. I have cad orange. So these are all cadmiums, but they make perfectly lovely transparent washes if we want them to, but they can become a bit more opaque, um, opaque if, you know, in the right situation, right? If they're applied thickly. Here we have burnt sienna, two wells. And I mostly it's two wells because I use it so much. Um, this is I think pyrrole red. And uh, this is quinacridone rose. And the truth is I don't use them very much. Um, these I keep empty to help them separate the wells, the colors, right? Warm colors, dark, mm -hmm. cool colors. Sometimes here I have um, small blue, which is a lovely granulating purple. It's like a, a violet maybe would be how I would describe it. Um, and I'm out of it right now. I have two wells of ultramarine blue and it is primarily for convenience because I use it so much. I have cobalt blue. Cobalt Turquoise Light by Windsor Newton. This is a nice semi-opaque granulating teal. And, and um, then I have Viridian. I use it a little bit and I like that it granulates. That's a nice element of what it does. I have chromium uh, Oxide of Chromium. This is a definitely very opaque pigment um, and can be really helpful for mixing up mid-values and then dropping it into a painting later. 
right? Like you want to paint opaquely, not just to make white, but sometimes to make um, little highlights that are have a color, have color in them. And then this is Perlin Green, and, uh, which I use mostly for mixing up really dark greens and helping me sort of in the process of mixing up my greens. So thank you, Claire, for asking that. I appreciate it. Um, all right, into this tree we go. So I'm mixing up kind of dark blue gray. It's too dark and too gray. So I have to add some brown to it because I want to do this tree trunk. So I'm just dropping in some of these interesting uh, browns. And then we're going to need to drop in some blues. And then as it dries, we'll come back over it and we'll do a little bit more. Um, now, this little area had a, a difficult, there was a part of it that was difficult. And um, I sort of danced around it when I was doing the no tan. And, um, and I'll, I'll show you what, I, what I'm talking about here in just a sec. And there's an answer to it, but it would have required a different kind of approach. So I'm painting in the dark side of this tree. And what I wanted to bring people's thoughts to is that sometimes in a, in a painting we have, um, we have two light valued areas that abut each other. And um, they're, it, if they mix together, then we have kind of this weird blobby experience where the two colors are bonding. So in here, I wanted to keep this little edge crisp for the edge of the tree. And over here, I have the foliage. Um, but if we look at the photo, a lot of this area is actually a pale blue because it's in shadow, kind of like what I had up here in this tree trunk. Well, when we have two pale values that connect, it can be really complicated to paint them. And you either, you have two routes, basically, in my experience for how you approach it. One route is you alter the photograph to meet the needs of the painting that you're working on. And in that version, what did I do? I made a sharp edge and I preserved a white over here. And um, that I basically uh, took away one of the super pale values, right? And now I, but I still have this contrast that I wanted to achieve. The other way you would do it is you would, um, Paint this green area, it would dry. And then you would paint the, the, the pale value of the sunlit edge of the tree. And then they could be next to each other, but not mixing, right? That can be complicated though, and it takes a long time. And sometimes you do it and you think, meh, it didn't really matter in terms of the final effect of the painting. So I bring it up just to say that in this subject, I ended up deciding I wanted to make forward progress on this. So I brought the green over to the edge, but I know in the photo, like there's little bits of blue and things that are in this shadowy area of the trunk. And um, right now I don't have any of that. I could, for example, later in the process, I could, uh, after it dries, I could put blue on then. That's another way to do it. So, and then this area would have a little bit of a cool shadow along its edge. But the truth is it's, it's small beans in terms of the total um, color choice element of what's going on in here. So we have this little sunny area on the trunk and we have ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I'm mixing up a dark value and I wanna help this tree curve into the shadow. So I'm mixing up a darker value and I'm dropping it in with a little brush and it's a little synthetic. And I choose a little synthetic because it doesn't carry as much water, right? So it makes this process easier. 
because it's not going to explode with moisture. But I want this little, I want this tree to sort of have some lost edges where it bonds with the shadows to the side. There we go. And also we're going to have now, we have a section that feels like it's going to get sunlit over on the right hand side. Now for the foliage, we're, I'm going to move back to this wonderful little Chinese calligraphy brush. And what's interesting to think about is this area is not as dark as this area. It is definitely a paler, bluer green. So I grab some cobalt blue and a little bit of water. And I like to do like a little test. So I'll do a little daub. I don't think I'd like it to be bluer. I want it to recede, right? And we're gonna have it recede again, even farther over. I think this will be fine. I grab a little more water. I have to remember, don't forget, it's gonna um, dry lighter, right? So here we go. So I, I did have a little pencil marks in here. These were to help me preserve this little area that's vibrant and sunny that's popping up around the edge of the trunk. And I'm getting little broken edges. And I hope you can see how uh, this little area that I'm painting that's in shadow is, while a shadow compared to the section next to it is clearly paler than this area closer to us, right? It's receding ever so slightly into the distance. Up here, we have other bits of foliage. Here's a little edge of a, one of the trunks. And here we go. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to smush my pre smush my brush and uh, daub it off and I smush it. It's all funky now. And I'm going to use this to wiggle around and I want to use the belly of the brush a little bit. And I want to get these little hairs to help me create the feeling of this foliage that is not super dense, right? I need to dry it off a little bit. I'm going to splay my brushes. And boy, when a morning. Somebody deciding to use a chainsaw. So I'm going to go close the door. I'll be back in a second. We're back. All right. So, <laughs> where was I? <clears throat> We're preserving some of this vibrant green. And it's letting me um, make little patches that are sunny, right? So, remember when we put it in at the beginning, and I was like, these are the areas on the no tan that are white. And they're helping me see what I should do first and what I should put on second. So I can see that this little area it is coming down. In the photo also, I can see that the trees are receding into the distance like this. There's like little tops. This is like the, the, some sort of edge of a canopy here. Right, and then they also come down a little further into here. I'm not going to go any further because they have to become more recessive in that sort of misty morning uh, walk that I was taking. So I want to get a little bit more in here. 
right? Here we have little sections where I'm letting <clears throat> the, um, the foliage peek through, right? And in here, it actually is little, little pieces that are like sky holes here. And then here at the base, we have a little area as well that's sunny. So it comes down, right? And always I'm thinking when I'm making these brush marks for trees, I'm definitely thinking, you know, I don't want to fill it all in. I have little areas where I fill it all in, but I have a lot of areas where I, I let little bits of dappled um, light essentially peek through, right? To make it interesting to the eye and to express that sort of treeness that we get. So here I've got the basic shape in, right? Of this shadow. Now, this is too dramatic of a transition. So after I've got this in, I can grab a smaller brush, right? And I can grab a dark, like a blue, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, bring it over here, grab a little bit of cobalt turquoise. Let's see, I'm gonna mix a little yellow in here. What I'm trying to do is create another uh, dark blue green, and we're gonna drop it into here, and it's gonna become like a little secondary bit of shadow, right? We want to complicate this area just a little, right? Because it's not all flat. And also because painting wet into wet is fun and painting uh, wet into wet is part of, I think, what makes a watercolor an interesting experience to view and an interesting experience to create. <clears throat> And um, there we go. So this mixture over here, you know, just to say, it's pretty thick. If I turn the board, it's not running. It's not a puddle. It's probably something in the milk or cream phase of the of the watercolor clock, if you know the watercolor clock. But it's not dripping. So even if you don't know the watercolor clock, you can compare, you know, you can look at it, tilt your board. And if it's running in, in a puddle, then we know mm, that's probably too wet. And that's why it's not mixing the way that you want it to mix. And it's like exploding on your sheet. That can be a real problem. So I am dropping some of these in and I'm dropping them in around where the uh, sky holes are in the tree because it helps create contrast. And there are little branches <clears throat> that run through this area. So since I have a synthetic and, and it's a small synthetic, it doesn't have a lot of water in it, right? And it lets me do um, small lines that aren't gonna sprint across the page and it helps me create the expression of a little bit of this feeling of, of branches in the upper canopy, right? I am, and I'm looking at the photo and I'm just trying to simplify it. There are little branches in the, in, in the photo and they lace their way through the, the subject. <clears throat> that one's too much. And this is a good time to insert them. Right, because when we do them wet and wet like this, one of the things it allows us to do is to express the idea that the branches are there without making the whole painting about these branches and, and you know, overstating their importance. We wanna communicate that the branches are there because we want these trees to feel real and tell the story of walking down this path. But I really don't care about the branches beyond the fact that they help me tell that story. So painting them wet into wet is one of the ways to do that. And as long as I use a small brush, <clears throat> daub it off, and I have a thick mixture of paint, right? When I drop it in, it's not gonna explode. 
Instead, what I'll get is a sort of gently fuzzy edge, and that can be really beneficial. Looking at this, it's too vibrant. So I'm going to grab this, daub it off. I'm going to dry brush on top of this. It's just too much. There we go. It's competing. Um, now, and I want it to be also darker down in here as we approach the ground, right? Shadows are getting cast upon shadows and the shadows do often get darker. So I wanna sit the canopy down. All right, let's get this to sort of recede into the distance. We're gonna do one more uh, application as we build this tree out and it recedes. I'm grabbing more cobalt blue, more water, right? And it's a very watery blue green. And what I'm just gonna do here is use the belly of the brush, right? Not the point, but the belly of the brush. And just using the paper to help me get these little bits of far away color. Now, the good news is that work we did at the beginning is still there and whoop, ah, it's still there. Um, oh, I know that. There we go. Um, so that's helping us create this gradient of value. Okay. And then this comes in. Here, I see little streaks on the ground plane down there. All right, they're just little things, little dips in the, and they're helping in the soil, they're bringing it over to the main edge. But all of this is a blue or green. It's just a gentle muted blue and it's just helping it recede. All right, let's get this dark area in here and then we can do the tree on this side. So this area in here, well, it's not really that dark, but it, it has dark elements in it, right? In the no tan, it's a lot of white. There's all this, and the white is this initial wash we did. It's all this, all these highlights. So what we're gonna do is I have this mixture with just ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I know it's a real surprise to everybody. I never use that mix. <laughs> and, um, we're gonna mix it up and, and it's all calligraphy. So I do, of course, I look at, What are the patterns that these leaves and bits of bark have when they fall down? But, you know, on some level, it's about drawing you closer to you so that the far away part feels farther away. And it's, it's okay to just make it up a bit. Um, it's busy, right? So, some of it maybe has a bit more uh, hue, meaning I want it to be not quite so dark. It's darker than this pale section, but I'm gonna add a little bit of, of brown, which, there we go. When I water it down, the brown appears. And I'm just bringing it down, helping it communicate this uh, slope, but it also helps communicate the recession into the distance. So if you look at the photo in here, it's there, all the little marks are much smaller. And if we look up close, the marks are big and dark, the little bits of fallen stuff. So it's doing a couple of jobs. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna splatter. A dangerous tactic, but I like it, the results. So I don't splatter like this. If I splatter like this, it'll go all over my sky. So I'm gonna direct the brush this way. A little bit of splatter. It just helps me create that organic um, sense of texture. I can smear it around a little bit with my finger, right? And we're just trying to activate this little space up here and make it feel strong and like it feel in the foreground so other elements recede. I can see that there's little 
little things that cross the border, right, into the, the, uh, the path. And I can see there's a little border on the path and just like a little occlusion shadow where one material is meeting the other, but it helps reinforce this transition between the two materials. Okay. And for the moment, that side is adequate. All right, let's get this other side and march along. So once again, I'm back to my Chinese calligraphy brush. This area is darker again. So I am grabbing uh, ultramarine blue because it's a darker valued blue, a little burnt sienna, too much. I'm gonna try some perlin green. Okay, there we go. Get this to be dark and muted, right? Now, we have a tricksy spot in here. It's where the sun's at. Um, what I'm not gonna do is wet this area so that, you know, to try and make it dissolve or something. It can be done. But if I do that, what's really gonna happen is a lot of this paint is gonna come into where the sun is at. What I'm gonna do instead is start painting this area dark. And as I get closer to the sun, I'm going to start introducing water and I'm gonna start introducing yellow and we're gonna paint it wet into wet. So here's this foliage. There we go. And okay, now I'm gonna grab a little more yellow. So I've got this kind of, yeah, it's too much green. I want more yellow, there we go. And I'm painting it wet into wet and I'm allowed to paint it wet into wet because in part, <coughs> um, the back of the painting is still wet, right? So everything is drying very slowly. So we're changing the, um, it's worth recognizing that we're changing the hue as well as the value, right? We're communicating this sunlight pushing through the foliage, partly because it's, it's a paler value, but we're also communicating it by the fact that it's transitioning into a warmer uh, yellow. Now the yellow in itself is actually <clears throat> a paler value, but it, if we had just done this with water and had it all stay really green, it wouldn't be quite as evocative as doing it with uh, color. So I'm gonna grab clean water and my little brush. And I am now, I'm gonna use just water and we're gonna help try and Take this soft, soft edge. So you might not notice, I daubed it off on my, on my little rag. I daubed it off on the uh, tissue, right? Not the tissue, uh, this is my little sponge. I'm just, I'm painting with water at the moment. I just want that to be soft, just in that little spot. <clears throat> um, now we can go back to painting with a bigger brush and a darker value around this edge, right? So here we have like the corona from the sun pushing through the tree. And the farther we get from the tree, from the sun, the darker it is, right? Until eventually, ah, we're back to that nice dark value again. So we're transitioning from the value, from the hue, Right, we have this kind of warm yellow, <clears throat> yellowy green around it, down into a darker blue or green. And here I'm actually pushing the bristles to give me these little edges. <clears throat> now in here, it is almost like fully colored in, so to speak, right? This goes on top. And we are approaching 
what's going to be almost the end of the painting here. We're getting close. So I'm grabbing a little bit more ultramarine blue and burnt sienna because down in here, there's like a overhang where this uh, tree is and it's close to us. Um, just like these things were here. So I want a very dark value to help us ex express the depth that we got. Gosh, come on. I'm super brown. I don't want to be very brown. More blue. There we go. A little bit of yellow. So I still want it to have color. I don't want it to be black. And we're transitioning again. Woo, that's dark. But I think it's going to be okay. Right? This is as we get the eye can only, you can't transit from this super vibrant area up top down into this area in here without the eye kind of squinting a bit. Um, so I have to, uh, I have little shadows to do in here, but they're a paler value of shadow than this really dark section I just did. And they're smaller shapes. So I'm gonna transition to a little brush again. So here's my number six, Escoda Perla. And just like before, I'm gonna grab more ultramarine blue. No, sorry, cobalt blue. And I'm just making this kind of little shadows here. And it's gonna help me express this road that we're walking on by giving me an edge. And I can see that there are little shadows even in here. And if actually we go back to the Notan, I was thinking about this earlier, even though I made this dark, right? I made this dark because it was part, it's the darker value on top of this pale value behind it, even though they're all really a pale value, that's the darkest value in that spot. That's why it's black in the Notan. And if we look in here, I still have like this little white streak and it's helping me separate spaces. So when I look in this, I'm missing that. So the way I'm gonna create it is I'm gonna get a pale valued shadow and add more cobalt blue to this little section and more water. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm actually gonna paint a super pale shadow on top of these pale trunks that are far away. And a lot of this is because I saw these gentle um, value shifts. That's too dark. I need it to be paler. I'm daubing it off on my shoulder. These gentle value shifts in the distance, and I wanted to preserve them to help us just experience a little bit of this feeling of recession. There we go. Right? Just a little bit. Um, and it comes into these greens here, right? This is actually a little sunny area, catching a little bit of sun. And then we have this foreground shadow. So I have to go back to a bigger brush, right? Bigger shapes need bigger brushes. And I am gonna um, mix up here. I have, uh, I got some blue. I got some blue because it's on the side of my palette. But I'm mixing up a little bit of ultramarine blue into this mix. And I can see it. there's a part of it that's important and detailed. And it's when it's along the edge of the path, the shadow is helping us see the edge of the path. And then down in here, it's just playtime. It's just a big cast shadow. So I'm going to come in here first. Ooh, that was more than I wanted. So I take up my little handy tissue. There we go. Dob off my brush. This is not dark enough. It's a little bit darker. And there we go. So that's the only part to me that's like super important that I capture this edge. And you might notice in the no tan I made, 
I went through this process of deciding how, um, let me put this brush down, how separated did I want these areas to be? And I decided I wanted a little, a little funnel, right? A little path of transit that would take me from this front area up into this area and kind of up into the sky. So I actually whited out this area and I didn't want the shadow to go all the way across and sort of chop that section in half. And so I'm actually doing that here. I actually left a little open area here on purpose so that the eye kind of has a little path to travel upwards into the painting. So we can play around with this down with this area down here. One of the things it has is um, soft edges. So I can take clean water and I can drop a little clean water in here. It's not everywhere on purpose. It's just allowing me, you're gonna see in a moment, to kind of have some play with my edges, right? So that some of these edges are gonna be hard and some of them are gonna be soft because they're gonna drop into where the water was. Over in here, it's basically all shadow. So I'm actually, and it's warmer because it's a, the material is changing, right? It's the ground plane is the foliage. So I drop in a little brown and I fill in some of the little sky holes, right? Yeah, something like that. Um, it's pretty wet, little guy. That's the sponge. It's been soaking up all the goo. Now, at this phase, I could be done, but I want to play a little bit more since we're having a good time here and it's only 10.30. Um, let me make sure. Uh, all right, yes, and Claire had asked earlier about um, my, if I was painting flat, and she also asked about my colors. So I just wanted to make sure there weren't anything that I was missing there. So at this phase, you know, I could be done, but one of my jokes is it's never too late to ruin a painting. So I do wanna, um, I figure, you know, like this could be more interesting. I'd like to get darker darks in here and, and I'd like to get it to feel a little warmer. It's a little cool to me. So what I'm gonna do is take my tissue and I'm gonna clean off an area. Why? Because I need somewhere to mix up some, some uh, clean, vibrant, yellowy greens. There we go. And um, I actually like this half on the right hand side more than I like this half on the left hand side. Um, I just think the left hand side's a little too cool. So I'm gonna mix up a yellow, a, co a, a cadmium yellow, but it's gonna basically be a glaze, right? Now this area is mostly dry. So I'm just dropping it in on top. And um, definitely this green here is too, um, too blue. It's actually like a chartreuse, but um, I want it to be a little sunnier in this area up close. And when it recedes, it's gonna get bluer and bluer. Now, of course, it's hard to tell. You know, I've recognized over time the camera is finicky about how it expresses color. So, you know, later on, we'll have, um, I'm going to share this tomorrow morning on the blog. And when I do, um, then we can, you can see, you know, something more color correct. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is I want to get these trunks to be a little bluer. So I'm going to clean it off, drop a little blue in here. Right. I just talked about wanting some of this to um, have a little nuance. And definitely this trunk here is not as dark as I'd like it to be. So I go over the top 
the, the contrast here was too bold. It's not meant to be the part I want to put my eye on. So I want to close up some of the contrast in there. I'm looking for my little brush. Got ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and it's thick, right? Um, I'm gonna go in here and give us some little detail to kind of hold on to, get it a little darker. Um, just wanna get this to have a little, little warmth over here. And I feel like this is a little too cool. I want it to be, um, it's a little too cool. I'd like it to be a little richer in color and a little warmer. So I have here a muddy brown and it's good. I don't mind using the junk on the, on the palette. And I'm just dry brushing in a little bit of color and I'd like it to be a little more muted. There we go. So, you know, it's definitely not a science. It's, it's still something I get to a part of a painting sometimes and I think, oh, you know what I'd like to do, blah, 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 instead. Um, as part of the process, it's definitely how I still get to learn um, as well. Um, and I might drop, it's after this dries, I could um, clean off a little section on my palette. Maybe I drop a little bit of blue in the distance, maybe behind the tree here. And I can do that if I do it real quick later on, right? And, and that's definitely something that I feel okay with doing. You know, I, um, this is just like the beginning of the process. And sometimes I'll take a painting and I know I'm doing it as a demo, but you know, it's still a process of making art. And for sure, if I'm making art and I'm not doing a demo, I complete it, I put it up on the wall, and then I stare at it. And sometimes I decide later, oh, I need to add this or that, right? Or, oh, I'm, whatever the case might be. And sometimes you just, I find, you know, it's not a race. Like I gotta, there's little somethings I gotta do later. And sometimes you have to let the eye rest and that's okay. And that's something that comes out of, I think doing watercolors you know, since it's so quick, I think if you're an, an oil painter, a lot of oil painters wait, that's really normal. Um, but for watercolorists, sometimes I feel like we're racing to the end and I don't think that's really needed. And I think sometimes it can be counterproductive. So I can't come in here and do uh, quite all of the little like, little strokes and things I might like to do in here. Yeah, I can get close. Just want to darken this edge up and round, make the tree feel rounder. If that makes any sense. Um, and I'm going to say for now, this little subject is finished. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to take it off of here and I'm going to have it face forward. I didn't know if anybody had any questions about the painting um, and the demo. I did want to say that um, today, uh, if you were on the wait list for signing up for the class, then you, you've gotten an email or you can sign up, go to the wait list. You can still do that that's on the blog posts and you can sign up and you'll get the URL to sign up for the class. Um, and then it'll open up for everybody else on the art learners list tomorrow. So um, I'm maxing out at 40 seats for the class. And um, I had almost a hundred people on the wait list. So I'm, I'm very curious to see how signups go, which is great. Right, it's a wonderful problem to have from my perspective. Um, but um, so if you are thinking, oh, I was thinking of taking the class, right? And you're on the wait list, mm, I would go and sign up for the class, right? Uh, for what it's worth. Um, and 
but the enrollment will go through the end of the week. So on Friday, I'll close down enrollment. Um, we'll have a week break between the end of enrollment and the start of the class, which will be on the 15th. Um, and then on the 15th, that Saturday, we'll start a series of the five all day Saturday classes. Um, and we'll, for me, it's exciting. And I hope it's exciting for people who are gonna take the class as well, because I've wanted to teach a more ambitious, longer form class for a lot of years. I've been thinking about this. And the, what's fun is it's, uh, it's compiling a lot of classes that I've taught separately into a single unit and then it's sort of expanding it. So um, folks before have taken classes where I've offered, we've done composition and that's a big piece of this class. And um, also people have uh, done stuff on color with me. We'll be talking a lot about color and how to apply it and how to use it to best effect. And people have done like clouds long ago, we did edges and cloud paintings. That was a long time ago. And we're gonna also be talking about edges, right? And there are all these different kinds of contrasts that you use in a painting to compose with. You, you compose with shapes and you compose with values, but you also compose with edges and you compose with color. So we're gonna be um, exploring the technical aspects of all those elements of painting. And then also how we use that, that technical aspect for compositional benefits in the painting. And then I'm gonna combine with that a daily painting challenge. So I'll be facilitating that and I'm gonna be sending out a painting and either like in the beginning, I'll have you do a no tan every day. The goal is to get you to just to do more of them so you get used to it. And then maybe we'll be moving into, okay, here's some paintings, do a small one just to get you rolling. And my experience as a student has always been that I, um, I would get introduced to a lot of content in a workshop and then I, I have to go apply it to really learn it, right? That's the way it works. And I would often have to apply it on my own. And then I would want to have more questions answered, but the workshop was over. So, um, so the idea for the class that I'm teaching is we're gonna do an all day Saturday class from nine to four, just like a normal workshop would be by Zoom. And then um, I'm gonna provide content for you to work on during the week to try and reinforce the stuff that we're doing in the Saturday all day intensive. And then I'll have a, um, a private Facebook group for you to share your content and post it and cheer us on, right? The goal is to get everybody painting and everybody sharing. And then we can start to compare your work to itself as you go through the process of trying to paint every day. So I know for a lot of people, the idea of even doing a small painting, 30 to 45 or 50 or 60 minutes seems incredibly daunting. And um, my hope is that by facilitating it and creating a group, that we can get more of you um, at least into that space, right? Where, where you're really working on it. So that is open for, for people who are on the wait list today. And, um, and it's open to people who are on the art learners list tomorrow. Um, and, I'll, and I've been sending out emails and things. And so if you're on the wait list, you've already gotten the URL. And if you'd like to sign up today, then you need to go to the blog and um, uh, sign up for the wait list and you'll get an automated email that'll give you the URL and you can save your spot in the workshop. Um, and I guess having said that, um, I was done for today. Um, you're welcome, Jackie. It's a pleasure uh, getting to paint with you. It's nice to see you, Sonia and Bernie. A lot of folks here, Eileen as well. So it's been a pleasure to paint this Sunday morning. I've been very busy working on the workshop and I haven't painted all week. So it's nice to get the brushes wet and paint with you. You're welcome, Ingrid. And um, if you're interested in re-watching this or sharing it with somebody else, it'll be on the blog on Monday morning. Thanks, you guys. Have Thank a good you. day. And it's good to see you. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. You. You're welcome. Bye.